Hi, welcome to the National Korean's Choice Online News. Uh, today, we'd like to introduce to you uh, His Excellency Ambassador Lee Kon Choi, who was a teacher, journalist, politician, diplomat, and author, and painter as well. And he's also the, uh, the member of the Legislative uh, Assembly of Singapore, a member of the first five parliaments of Singapore, in fact, a senior minister of state, and an ambassador and high commissioner of to eight countries. Upon his retirement, he founded his own firm, Eng Lee, uh, Lee Investments Consultants, in 1990, and also sits as a director of a number of companies such as Gold Brothers Group Limited. Today, the National Quiz Choice celebrates uh, the launch of His Excellency Ambassador Lee Kung Choi's new book, his 14th book, at, at, uh, in fact, The Golden Dragon and Popo Phoenix, The Chinese and Their Multi-Ethnic Descendants in Southeast Asia, published by the World Scientific. You can place an order with Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, or your nearest bookstore. Uh, your Excellency, uh, Ambassador Lee Kung Choi, thank you for joining us here at the National Prince Choice, and it's been a real honor to have you on our show. Um, tell us, you know, uh, why do you choose to write this book uh, uh, on the issues of history of the Chinese and their multi ethnic <coughs> descendants in Southeast Asia? You know, were you uh, been personally uh, affected by it? Well, I was uh, keen in this in this subject since I was a boy. <clears throat> I have eleven brothers and five sisters. <clears throat> My father was not well educated, but he was a, a prominent rich man in Batuwa. <clears throat> he sent me to, as usual, he sent me to English school. So I went to English school. I. Somehow I didn't, I didn't like the environment, so I came back. So he chased me out with a broomstick. I went to a nearby Chinese school where he was the chairman of the board. The principal took me to see him, say, your, your son wants to study Chinese. Anything he likes. So I started studying Chinese. <clears throat> Having studied Chinese, I believe that I couldn't believe that any Chinese cannot speak Chinese and do not understand China. And I'm staying in Baba family. All my brothers cannot write the name in their own name in Chinese. So I was wondering why, why <coughs> this education has such a big impact on on the people. <coughs> So, <clears throat> as I grew up, <clears throat> of course, because of Ch I studied Chinese, they, they say it's a <clears throat> useless langu language. You get nowhere under British rule. You cannot get a job. <clears throat> and because I studied Chinese, I became anti-Japanese. And I acted as a, on a stage, conducted a harmonica team at the age of 13, raised funds to fight the Japanese. <clears throat> Actually, I acted as a Japanese on the stage <laughs> and was shot. <clears throat> then <clears throat> I knew that the danger of studying Chinese when the Japanese invaded Malaya. I was studying, I was the, staying in Penang. They, they, they read my background and was looking for my head. They went all hunting. So I ran to the jungle and became a farmer at the age of 17. I reared pigs, planted vegetables, did coconut oil for three years. <clears throat> so, that, that is the danger of studying Chinese without knowing the Japanese was going to invade Malaya. After that, I became a journalist. I, I ran, went around Thailand, Philippines, Cambodia, all these places. <clears throat> Malaysia, of course. I find most of the Chinese, they say they are Chinese, they say they are I'm Thai. I don't know. I don't don't speak Mandarin. 
they don't know much about China. <clears throat> so so with the Filipinos and all this. So also another curiosity, why Chinese begin to forget their language and culture. <clears throat> then I went into politics. I became parliamentary secretary to Ministry of Culture. Incidentally, I had an Indonesian professor <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Slamat Moyono, professor. He was a professor in in the study of ja Javanese and Islamization. So he gave me a book of Tuang, Tuang Ku Rao. This book contains nine Bali Songo. Bali Songo is a famous or nine Islamic saints who overthrew the helped to overthrow, overthrow the Majapahit Empire in Hindu Empire. And he told me that eight of them have Chinese blood. So I, I got interested in because the, they was the one who converted almost the entire Chinese population of Java in Ming Dynasty when Cheng Hu, Cheng Hu was connected also Cheng Hu, the Admiral Cheng Hu, who was also a Muslim, Yunak. He was the one also had some connection with the Wali Song. <coughs> They talk about assimilation. So he explained to me the meaning of assimilation. So I got interested. I said, then there was the reason why all these people don't speak because they have been assimilated. So I made a study of Thailand, Filipino, Cambodia, all the countries, how Chinese migrated to the country, how they were assimilated to intermarriage with local girls. <coughs> how they forgot their language. <clears throat> but I kept it at that because I was too busy with politics. I kept the material uh, <clears throat> until three years ago when I started writing on this book. This is my 14th book. <clears throat> so I, it took me half a century to collect material. <clears throat> uh, I begin to I read a lot of books on overseas Chinese by Chinese scholars, but they only mention the life of overseas Chinese. They never mention anything about intermarriage with local girls, how the Chinese were assimilated. So my my book is quite it's not <coughs> it's not about overseas Chinese. It's about how overseas Chinese have been assimilated and become local citizens, Thai, Filipino, you know. <clears throat> so this is a new angle. And the, the, Chinese, the Chinese government is very interested in my book because it's the first time they know what happened to overseas Chinese who have left the country. Then there's no trace of them. No books have ever been written only about overseas Chinese. Of course, always, well, they live in, they have Chinese schools. Chinese Association, <clears throat> but all of this mostly have gone, except still still surviving some. There are some Chinese who are still, all, all, all the time, but they are still mentally, culturally Chinese-minded. <clears throat> and nowadays when we talk about overseas Chinese, we are thinking of the <clears throat> new Chinese from after communist took over. When we talk about overseas Chinese before, they came out to look for a job with a small bag, a very tough job. But now Chinese come out with currency, a bag of money to invest in this and to do that. They want to migrate because they want to change the environment. So this is quite a different situation. And so Ambassador Lee, um, what is the definition of the Chinese uh, migration? Is leadership, DNA and assimilation. Yeah. yeah uh, what's what's your definition? You know, uh, your perception of Chinese race migration and leadership DNA and, and assimilation. Has that changed for you over the years? 
Well, Chinese migration started very early, since the Song Dynasty, the Ming, and Qing. <clears throat> then, as they they migrated to these countries, they didn't bring the wives. Those, in those days, difficult to get a woman out from China. So they marry local girls. And of course, the children speak the mother tongue of the mother and uh, <coughs> assimilate the culture. It's called assimilation. <coughs> because uh, uh, <coughs> the Chinese, when they are overseas, there are no, no Chinese school. Uh, they have to mix with local people. So the environment forced them to be <coughs> to be assimilated. And one very important fact <coughs> during the Qing dynasty there were five <coughs> massacres in Philippines. The Filipinos were killing Chinese. Yet the Chinese government say to hell with them. Who asked them to leave us? To hell with them. Nobody cares for them. In 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 1740, in 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 Jakarta, the Dutch butchered the Chinese until they turned the Chirikong River into red red color. Then the Qing dynasty, Kaiser, Kaiser, they, they, they deserve to die. So there's no protection. There was, there was no protection at all from the Chinese government. So and naturally they feel it's better, it's safer, it's more secure to, to become part of the people. So they gradually they get assimilated. What do you think about uh, academics and policy makers have, to, have a lot to say about Chinese migration and its leadership, DNA and assimilation? <coughs> well, the olden scholars uh, <coughs> I don't blame them. They, they, they only look at the Chinese, they how migrated there. They want to know what happened to them. The Chinese schools association. <coughs> but very few. I, I think I have not seen any looking into assimilation <coughs> methods. Because they, they are assimilated, they are no more overseas Chinese. They don't speak Chinese. So how can we call them overseas Chinese? Their loyalty is with the local people, local government. So <coughs> gradually, even Chinese schools are losing out. <coughs> Take Singapore, for instance. We were. 70-80% Chinese. In the old days, <coughs> there was Chinese schools. <coughs> uh, and because of all that, the Communist Party came in to an interest in trying to convince the minor people. The Communist Party was in control of the political situation. So when Lee Kuan Yew came, <coughs> you see in, in Malaysia, the Chinese, uh, in the British time, 1946, 40, 47, British then with, <coughs> uh, a, a, an officer <coughs> to have a new constitution for people but British took took back from the Japanese. <coughs> then this uh, officer came up with a constitution constitution giving equality to Chinese, Malays, Indian, all equal. And in those days, Tan Kaki, 
our famous anti-Japanese hero, was so loyal to China that he was not interested in Malay, Malayan politics. He never raised up any voice to, <coughs> to support the, the constitution, proposed constitution. Chinese were loyal to China. They are not interested in local politics as a leader. So, so Malays formed the UMNO, United Malaysian, fought against this. And then the British saw, oh, Malays were the real country. The Chinese are not interested. So this, that we lost the opportunity to have equal rights with the Malays. Lost once and for all, they changed the constitution, Chinese become second class up to today. You know, <coughs> uh, I forgot the name, but <coughs> in Singapore, the People's Action Party is controlled by English educators, led by Lee Kuan Yew, Ko King Sui, To Chin Chai. <coughs> so westernized <clears throat> and with the fear of communism, Chinese dominated communism. So gradually changed the system. <clears throat> when I was a parliamentary secretary, Ministry of Education, 1962, English and Chinese were equal, equal status. But today, the system is so changed that whole country, young people, angry, angry science. There's no more Chinese school. Nanyang University closed down. Even our dialects, we turn away with our dialects. <coughs> so we become angry science. <coughs> Not Singapore. So you, you ask any young people about China, they don't, they don't know much. They're not, not so interested. They're only interested in, in, in in, in <coughs> English and, and the West West. Uh, <coughs> so I, that, that's why I think every country has got different situation. <coughs> in Thailand, because uh, people so grum, first Prime Minister after the war, he saw the fear of Chinese threat. Uh, Dr. Sanya's son <coughs> was promoting Chinese nationalism. Without Dr. Sanya's son's uh, nationalism, today the whole of Indonesia, all Chinese would have been converted. Because they promoted again Chinese nation, national consciousness. They started Chinese school again. Uh, Sukarno also supported because they wanted China support. So Chinese nationalism came out. <clears throat> and then a clash. <clears throat> you know, the nationalism. So every country has different circumstances. So I make a study. I went to get some experts from different countries and become his friend. Make a study, try and read books. I came to the, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea for a Chinese to become Thai, Filipinos, Malaysian, because it's quite natural. I myself, I was in my school days, because there was no nationalism, my loyalty was with China. But after that, I went to England to study I met Lee Kuan Yew, Ho King Sui To Chin Chai. My mind changed. So what is the use of being loyal to China when it cannot help you? Better do, do something for your country. So I joined them in the, in the independent struggle. Became the earliest MP. You know, it's a more practical to be where you are. You have control over your, your own, own future. Then, than, than uh, an empty patriotism. 
So it's more realistic. I think also the Chinese also become realistic. 1975, I was deputy foreign minister. I went with Raja Ratnam to, to Beijing to look for Chao Enlai, the prime minister. <coughs> I had met him in 1955 in Bandung Conference. So <clears throat> we became friends. So I asked him one question. At that time, <coughs> very few Chinese would like to participate in local politics. I said, there's nothing wrong. I said, nothing wrong. You better participate in local politics more important to you. So he was the one who, who liked and mm, encouraged the Chinese to participate in local politics. So that's a very, very important point. Uh, Ambassador uh, Li Kung Choi, please tell us uh, why did you choose the title Golden Dragon and Purple Phoenix? <coughs> uh, what's your inspiration behind this title? Well, China is known as dragon always. So I consider the immigrants as golden dragon. When they produce the children, they become purple phoenix. Phoenix very, very lasting. They burn also, they rise again. Those overseas Chinese born, they're very resistant, resist. Resistance, the, the, the fighters, they overcome all kinds of difficulties. Your Excellency, uh, yeah. Ambassador Lee, um, can you tell us what kind of books are you reading right now? And uh, what kind of books are you reading right now? Oh, <clears throat> reading? Yes. Are there any books you're reading right now? Well, <clears throat> I read all kinds of books connected with what I'm going to write. <coughs> so I'm, I'm writing two more books, almost completed. One is the role of, my role in the hosting. I wrote a book on the beat to the hosting. How I, from a journalist, I went to politics. This is a continuation, what I did during my nearly 30 years in government. What I've done for the government as ambassador to eight countries. In, in <clears throat> my role in, in party, party. <clears throat> that, uh, well, this, this, this book, my, the book on Golden Dragon, Purple Phoenix will be translated into Chinese. It's, it's almost, almost completed. So the Chinese government pay much attention to this book because it, they want to know what happened to overseas Chinese. <coughs> My book on the role will, will tell the whole history of PAP, how it was started, what, my, what role I played in, in, in terms of party politics, uh, diplomacy, and, and government role, what, <coughs> what role I played. <clears throat> the second book is The Secret of Youth. So I'm going to tell how I, my mind is still active at nearly 90. What, what sort of exercise I do, you know, those, those uh, <clears throat> I do in the Indonesia, in Indian Kundalini Yoga, and Chinese deep breathing. And uh, I did I breathe from my stomach, not from my chest. So all this I I write in a book. Are there any books in your life that have uh, affected you most? Uh, are there books that you have read that have affected you the <coughs> most? I read many books. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I can't remember which. Or any personalities <coughs> that you came across. I 
I read a lot of books, especially during Japanese out in the jungle. <coughs> uh, the British were staying nearby, abandoned the house, and I went there and full of books. So uh, while a farmer, I, I read well, <coughs> Western passage, is it? So you ransacked the whole library? Yes, yes, the whole library. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I like to read. I read not only in English and in Chinese, in Indonesian, in a little bit of Japanese. Do you, do you think uh, most people uh, see Chinese migration is leadership uh, DNA and assimilation is mainly a political issue? and not a spiritual and moral issue. Do you think it should be addressed as a spiritual and moral issue for the uh, uh, yeah. for for Chinese migration and and Chinese DNA as well as the assimilation? <coughs> Do you think that it is a moral and, and a spiritual issue for the Chinese? Moral? Yes, moral and spiritual issue rather than political. <coughs> But in the old days, the Chinese regard those who leave the country as disloyal. <coughs> but it is quite natural <coughs> because uh, <coughs> at one time there was a when, the, when the, the British did away with slave labor, a great shortage of workers all around the world. So they thought of China as the source of labor. So <clears throat> they have a new treaty agreeing with Chinese to allow Chinese to migrate. So that was the time when the, the mass migration of Chinese. Because China, Chinese uh, political situation not stable, economically tough, tough to live there. It's easy to look for be better pastures out, outside China. <clears throat> so that's why my father also migrated at the age of 16. So my, most people, Cantonese especially, migrated to America. Then you know, the Fujian, the miners, Hakka, went to Ipo. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I find a very inter interesting point. Migration doesn't mean every country can, can assimilate them. <clears throat> I find that in Islamic countries, the, two, the rules are too strict. You have to marry. Once, once you marry a Malay girl, you have to be an Islam. So that is very important, the, the preventing from so you, generally speaking, the Buddhists and Christians are easily assimilated. The Buddhism in Thailand. And, Buddh and Thailand is a clear example of success in assimilation. Because the Thais are more open-minded. Once you become a Thai, you have equal rights. Equal rights very important. The Thai treat the Chinese as Thais. They give them the equal opportunity. <clears throat> Whereas in Malaysia it's quite different. You see, <clears throat> you must have you must as attract the immigrants to be part of your citizen. Get their talents. Don't let them flow out. You know, the, the racialism plays a very important assimilation. So <clears throat> assimilation is very natural because the whole, country, whole world needs workers. 
when you migrate there, what is the use of being loyal to your mother country when they cannot help you? So better be assimilated. There's no, no, no moral issue at all. Do you, do you think the Chinese believe in manifest destiny? Uh, and what is manifest destiny by definition to policy makers? Uh, manifest destiny. You manifest, see, yeah. yeah, manifest destiny. Because it seems that the Chinese believe in destiny. Yeah, yeah. You know, they have a very strong belief in it. Uh, so, uh, uh, is is this is that uh, how you feel? And uh, is that your observation that Chinese believe in the Chinese believe in manifest destiny, where they create. Uh, their own destiny because they, they perceive that this is their <coughs> destiny. Generally speaking, most Chinese are individualists. They look to what they can get. You know, not like Japanese. Japanese are very uh, state conscious. They're conscious that they are Japanese. They're have relationship with the state, <clears throat> but less individualist. They group, they group as a group. But Chinese, everywhere in the world, you find any immigrant must be a Chinese because he can live alone. The Chinese have the ability to survive alone without without group. Individually, they can survive even the North Pole. You know. <clears throat> So the Chinese are very individualistic. They, they, they don't grow in groups. So in that sense, of course, naturally they, they look for their own 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 benefit. They, they, they are very in, in, initiative, very hardworking, very inventive, very creative. You know, <clears throat> they work very hard. <clears throat> but uh, what 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 worries me now? This quality is gradually losing out, even in China. The Chinese say, Li Yi Lian mannerism, talk about passion, your loyalty, thrift, uh, honesty, and shame. These four are very important. It's gradually losing its nature in, in China even. The Chinese young people, they don't know what manners. You know, they, they, no shame. They do anything. That quality is very important to, for Chinese to preserve. Not only China, Singapore. Singapore, there are many children who don't care for the parents. You know, they, they, they are losing the quality, hardworking. Our, our, our ancestors came here very hardworking, very thrifty. But now, the quality is gradually changing. So you believe that, that, that this generation ha has lost the sense of conviction and moral values? Yes. So how can policymakers and the members of the public change that? Well, up to the family and, and government. Government should do something to, to, to instill the good quality of our, our immigrants. Hardworking, thrifty, honesty. These are gradually losing out. Now, in your uh, new book, the 14th book that you've written, uh, The Golden Dragon and Purple Phoenix, uh, which is your favorite chapter? Of your book? <coughs> I think Indonesia. Why? <coughs> because Indonesia, <coughs> because uh, I, I was, uh, <coughs> I was ambassador to Indonesia for four and a half years. So I studied a deep study in the Chinese, how they change and the Wali Songo, the ninth Islamic saint, very important in Indonesia. The Indonesians do not know that eight of them have Chinese blood. But 
how they managed to assimilate the entire Chinese population <coughs> and how change again back again. <coughs> In Indonesia is a very interesting country <coughs> to study racial relationship. I think the Chinese have not played too well, not <coughs> have, have done quite well. <coughs> there are so many changes. During Sukarno's time, quite equal. Chinese university even. Allowed two Chinese ministers. Then Suharto changed everything. Everything banned the Chinese language. Don't allow any Chinese to celebrate Chinese New Year. He did a lot for the country, but culturally and language was a mistake for him. Then Gusdul took over. Gusdul's ancestors were Chinese. His great 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 grandfather followed Cheng Ho to Indonesia. So he, he openly admitted that he has got Chinese blood. He changed, turned over Suato's policy to make Chinese language low, legal, newspaper legal, Chinese school legal. <coughs> and then he allowed the festivity Chinese. I think Gusdu has done a lot for the Chinese in, 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 in Indonesia. Uh, do, you, do you think that there's such a thing as the, the Chinese DNA? Uh, you know, uh, do societies uh, around the world, even in Southeast Asia, with the rise of many of the prominent leadership uh, emerge from the Chinese uh, ancestry? Uh, is there such a thing as Qi, that the, the, the blood uh, is actually a Chinese DNA uh, that arises from this? Do you think there's scientific proof that only the Chinese DNA could produce better leadership? You mean the blood? Yes. <laughs> well, part of it because they have the enterprising aspect of of DNA uh, and willing to take pains, hard working initiative. I think all this although there's some of them they may, may not admit they they are Chinese but you can't help it you you have Chinese blood you cannot say I don't have no, many, many of Chinese blood, but they're very anti-Chinese. But still, they cannot run away from the fact that the, the blood that promoted the action. Now, when you wrote this book, who, uh, uh, who do you write this book for? Uh, it's uh, the, golden, the Golden Dragon and the Purple Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, are you addressing to, to, to academia or...? Are you addressing to the general public? Uh, who do you write for when you wrote this book? I write generally for the people of Southeast Asia to make them realize that they are not doing anything wrong. You know? They have been assimilated, so what? It's the right thing to do. But some of them do not know. Do governments uh, in Southeast Asia realize that they do also have some Chinese ancestry, in, uh, including the, uh, including the the, the Brunei and uh, yeah. uh, Indonesian uh, politics, yeah. because many of them uh, may be Muslim, but they have Chinese uh, ancestry and assimilation yes. uh, in them. Do they realize that? Yes, yes uh, <coughs> many, many realize. <coughs> and how do they feel? Do they, do they, do they uh, reveal that to you? I feel, I feel. <coughs> I feel very happy with the situation. The Chinese can be ties, <coughs> but if they, but there's no harm knowing that you, you have Chinese blood and there's no harm studying Chinese and understanding China. You know, I'm not against any Chinese becoming a tie or I agree, it's the right, right, right thing to do. Like I have become a Singaporean. 
you know. <coughs> but I have never not forgot, forgotten Chinese culture and language. Very important. Chinese culture and civilization have 5,000 years history. A lot of wisdom you can learn. Why, 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 why boycott the language? <coughs> Suharto should have realized that with Chinese wisdom, Indonesian Chinese can do better instead of not allowing to study Chinese. It's a blind, blind spot. <coughs> you, learn, you learn Chinese culture, that doesn't mean you are not loyal to Indonesia. You can still be loyal to Indonesia, but the wisdom. Why, why do you want to deprive them of this wisdom? <coughs> What makes this book different from the others on Chinese migration and assimilation and leadership? Uh, the book that you have written, The Golden Dragon and Purple Phoenix. Uh, uh, what, uh, what makes this book different from all the other books in the market today? In the, the book that you wrote, um, how, why is it, it, is, it is different from all the other books uh, in the market? <coughs> what makes this book unique? Well, it is because of the first time people look a different perspective of Chinese blood in Southeast Asia. Many Europeans, Americans, they see Chinese, but <coughs> they don't speak Chinese, and they think they're Chinese. They're Thais, they're no more Chinese. The wrong, wrong, wrong perception. So it's a right time for them to have, have a right per, per perspective. What are the some practical steps policymakers, academics, and the general population uh, can make uh, of, of and, and to find a deeper appreciation and enhance uh, harmonious living uh, uh. from this book? You know, uh, could you provide some insights for uh, for policymakers and academics mm. and the general population to find uh, appreciation <coughs> and enhance harmonious living? You see, I, I write this book to encourage more academicians to look into this subject. So that they go deeper, <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> and do you have anything specific uh, to say to your readers reading this book? Uh, um, do you have anything specific that you do like to tell to to the readers about this book that you have written? Uh, any any life uh, lessons and message that you have taken away from writing this book? Message. Yes. Any, any life lessons and <coughs> message that you want to give to the readers about this book that you've written, The Golden Dra Dragon and the Purple Phoenix? Mm. I think the bad thing is that <coughs> is I, I hope that the readers <coughs> will be able to differentiate between a real Chinese and an assimilated Chinese. They come to Singapore. <coughs> Lee Kuan Yew has said so many times that Singaporeans are quite different from Chinese. The perception, you know. <coughs> so they must be able to think, distinguish between the real Chinese not affected by assimilation, and those already become ties, you know. <clears throat> the different, different type of animal. <laughs> so to your perception and definition, what is a real Chinese? Huh? What is a real Chinese? A Chinese, <clears throat> I would say a Chinese is one, <clears throat> Who knows? A Chinese you can distinguish between a Chinese and Singaporean. 
and now even the character of Chinese is changing. You know how to say, you know, they, <coughs> they lose their old values. So the China, I would say a Chinese, somebody from China, brought up in China, circumstances, <coughs> and those brought up in other parts of the world. So mm, it's, it's difficult to you just American Chinese. You, you can see straight away it's, it's not it's not from China. No. <coughs> so <coughs> even the Chinese should be should see the assimilated Chinese in South Asia. <clears throat> with a more sense of per perspective. They know more that their own. Their loyalty is different. They don't know the culture. So, <laughs> it, <clears throat> and even the Chinese themselves are changing every day. The difference between Chinese and Taiwan. Taiwan Chinese are more co Chinese culture. China, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that Chinese gradually losing. They don't, don't even know the history of China. I met so many. <laughs> so how, what, what do you call a Chinese? The Chinese should be one who Chinese culturally, cultured Chinese, know about Chinese history, culture. But now, in China, it's very difficult. The young people, <coughs> well, once again, Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador Lee Kuan Choi, thank you for sharing with us okay. your insights. Uh, but before we go, what will be the three key lessons that you have learned so far? Uh, huh? What are the three key lessons you have learned uh, uh, from writing this book? Mm. Uh, the Golden Dragon and Purple Phoenix. Uh, were there any takeaways after you have finished writing this book after 50 years uh, which <coughs> you would like to share with us? Well, the only thing that worries me is that some people, I don't know why, they just refuse to admit that they have Chinese blood. <laughs> <That's> <coughs> Some countries, they, they're very, <coughs> Cambodia also very, very sensitive. <coughs> but I do my best. I say what I like, and I dare say it. Very, very few words. Uh, people, <coughs> writers, they put down what, <coughs> but I'm open to criticism. You can criticize me, I can reply to you, <coughs> but my, it was it, with great sincerity that I write this book without, of, uh, without any intention of offending anybody. I write folks facts as it is. The scholars may, may not agree, <coughs> you know, <coughs> but <coughs> I, I <coughs> I'm convinced of my facts, and I write it. Once again, to your your excellency, Ambassador Lee Kong Choi, thank you for joining us here at the National Prince Choice for sharing your insights and passion. Uh, on the Golden Dragon and Purple Phoenix. Uh, and uh, viewers, you can place your order of this book, book um, with Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, at your nearest bookstore, or uh, from your hometown. Uh, do join me again in the next episode on Facebook, YouTube, and all leading social media. Uh, just look for me at Robin Steinberg and sign up. And once again, thank you for joining me at the National Critics' Choice. I'm Robin Steinberg. Have a good week ahead.